Welcome. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Dr. Dorina Drizzo Harris and president designate of CHEST and the past president of the CHEST Foundation. I want to welcome everyone to the New York City stop on the CHEST Foundation's national listening tour. We are honored in New York City to be part of a national search for a solution to the issues related to access and equity for our patients with chronic lung diseases. We started this process because we know that not everyone has equal access to healthcare. Not everyone with lung disease can get to the doctor or can afford the appropriate treatment. This work is important for our patients and for the doctors who take care of them. We want to help our patients get the care they need. Today, we want to listen and learn. We have doctors, healthcare experts, and patients. We also have community leaders and national leaders from the CHESS Foundation who have started this conversation for us and can help enact change. We're grateful for the part you are all playing this evening in this listening tour with us. I am thrilled to introduce Sumathi Reddy of the Wall Street Journal who is going to be our moderator this evening. She writes a weekly consumer health column called Your Health, and I wanna thank her for joining us tonight. Good evening. My name is Sumathi Reddy, and I'm honored to be here with you all. These issues are important to me because as a health columnist, I frequently interview patients who struggle with access to healthcare, particularly quality healthcare. So it's great to be here tonight with a group whose mission is aligned with providing equal health care access to all. Let me start with the introduction of our hosts. We have Dr. Nagin Hajizada, who is an associate professor at the Institute of Health Innovations and Outcomes Research, Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research, and the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. She is a pulmonologist and critical care physician who spends a lot of her time as a physician scientist looking for ways to improve the health outcomes of people with chronic lung disease. Welcome. Next, we have Dr. Joan Reibman, who's a professor of medicine and environmental medicine at NYU School of Medicine and medical director at WTC Environmental Health Center and medical director at NYU Bellevue Asthma Airways Environmental Program. We also have Clara Londoño, a community relations and outreach manager at Plaza del Sol Community for Urban Health Plan, where she's worked since 2007. We have Dr. Doreen Adrizo Harris, who is a professor of medicine at NYU School of Medicine and currently the president designate of CHEST and trustee at CHEST Foundation. And we have Uday Tambar, vice president of community health at Northwell Health. Uday is part of a team that focuses on improving patient and community health outcomes by addressing social determinants of health. We have Rudy Anderson, Executive Director of the CHESS Foundation. He has spearheaded this listening tour to shed light on issues of trust, access, and equity that exist for patients with chronic lung disease. The CHESS Foundation is our host for this conversation. Rudy, the Executive Director, is going to explain a little how this evening came to be and what the foundation's vision for this listening tour is. Thank you, Sumathi. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm sure um, for many of you, you might not quite know who, who CHESS is or the CHESS Foundation, um, but I'm sure at some point, everyone has run into a pulmonologist, whether for your own lung condition, for a lung condition of your family, um, or even uh, critical care work. And, and maybe unfortunately you or a loved one have, has been in the ICU. Uh, or uh, as many of you have seen or heard um, with COVID-19, our pulmonologists have not only been on the front lines but leading the efforts in battling a difficult disease. And so um, when thinking about the listening tour, um, just a, a few things, right? So the CHESS Foundation really cares about championing lung health. And with that work, we've really focused on the work we can do in patient education, delivering greater resources to patients, um, work with uh, clinical research. So how do we support new efforts, right, uh, on the clinical front to get better treatments and 
um, diagnoses and ultimately better outcomes for patients by supporting our clinicians in the field. Um, and then also with the work we can do in the community. Are there things that we can develop and participate in to really push people in a way that gives them greater opportunity? And, and that really is, is where this has spawned is, um, given where we are in society, um, we've really struggled with getting a better understanding of what can we do to address health disparities and even some of the work in, in anti-racism. You know, a great quote that I am totally stealing from Megan is, disease doesn't discriminate, but our healthcare system does. And a lot of what this has spawned from and, and understanding that terminology was actually from, um, a, unfortunately, a patient that passed away, name's Aaron Popovich. Now the Popovich name might ring a few bells for some people. Uh, she was the late wife of coach Greg Popovich of the San Antonio Spurs. And she unfortunately a few years ago passed away from a chronic lung illness. And throughout her life, she has always dedicated the work that she had done towards those that needed um, access and resources the most. And while she was dealing with her own chronic lung issue and saw how much she had suffered, right, and struggled with gaining air, um, and she knew all the resources that she had, um, really what tore her up the most was not how much she was struggling, but what did that mean for other people that did not have the resources that she had, right? Um, all the things that were available to her, the relationship that she had with her uh, pulmonologist and clinician that was treating her disease over such a long period of time, those were all things that she cared so deeply about, which was how can others have the same access or could even afford the same access that she could? At the same time, the relationship that she had built and how she felt empowered to participate in her, her disease and her uh, fight um, was something that she knew was missing for many others. And so with that, we have the Aaron Popovich Endowment, which has allowed us to really start this conversation of instead of saying, hey, we have a solution for you, for many of you that have suffered from chronic lung disease um, and maybe even have suffered from COVID-19, and now, um, right, we have this bright light that's been shown down on, on many of these disparities in our marginalized communities. Um, this really is now an opportunity to listen, to take the time to hear from patients and caregivers and community organizations and our clinicians that are treating these patients that are on the front lines that are trying to do the good work. So we as an organization can figure out the best way that we can support you to create community interventions, and most importantly, elevate your voice so many others can hear that struggle, understand the story, and hopefully come on board and, and join us in this fight to um, end many of the disparities that we see in our healthcare system today. With that, I, I believe I'm passing this over to Megan. Thanks, Rudy. As our moderator, Sumathi mentioned before, I'm a clinician and researcher in New York City. And these are the patients I see every day. I know firsthand the barriers that they face. I believe that physicians cannot effectively take care of patients in a vacuum, which doesn't consider their real life barriers to good health, which includes socioeconomic and cultural barriers, as well as unfortunately racism amplified barriers. Many New Yorkers and, uh, suffer from lung disease and barriers to achieving overall good health in our city. An estimated 12% of adults in New York City suffer from chronic lung disease. Our poverty levels and percentage of people without health insurance are well above the average uh, on, on national level, according to the recent uh, US Census estimates. Asthma is a leading cause of emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and missed school days in New York City's poorest neighborhoods. Asthma is more common among low-income Black and Latinx children in our city and is more commonly uncontrolled with frequent emergency room visits. People living with asthma in New York City have double the rates of hospitalization compared to the rest of the state. Latinx people comprise 27.5% of New York City residents, close to 2.5 million people, and have higher prevalence of asthma than non-Latinx whites, with 15% of New York City adult Latinxes reporting an asthma diagnosis. 
and over 20% 20, 20 of adult Puerto Rican uh, Latinx people. Environmental exposures intertwined with socioeconomic barriers and stressors explain a large portion of the burden of chronic lung disease in New York City, which are amplified all the more in the black and brown communities by systemic and other forms of racism. Uh, in New York's poorest neighborhoods, which also have the highest percentage of black American and Latinx residents, the death rates for virtually every health condition are 30% higher than the city's wealthiest neighborhoods. That includes deaths from chronic lung disease. Now, COVID-19 has amplified these stark differences in health. Black and Latinx people in the US are three times more likely to contract COVID-19 than their white neighbors, and nearly twice as likely to die. COVID-19 can cause lasting harm to the lungs, increasing the demand for lung health care, such as pulmonary rehabilitation. The pandemic has increased poverty in New York City, with over two thirds, 68% of post-pandemic job losses being among persons of color. Latinx people bear a particularly high burden, experiencing 32% of lost jobs compared to a 26% of all New York City private sector jobs. New Yorkers have lost health coverage because of the pandemic. Black Americans in New York City reported losing health insurance twice as often as new other New Yorkers, particularly white New Yorkers. Latinx New Yorkers reported losing health insurance nearly four times as often as white New Yorkers. That's 23% compared to 6%. Compounding these disparities to achieving good health is now the digital divide. Further hampering access to health care for many as, as health care systems have rapidly switched over to telehealth in the setting of this pandemic. Only 58% of Black Americans and Latinx Americans report owning a desktop or a laptop computer, which are often required for telehealth access. About 20% of Black Americans and Latinx Americans reported being smartphone only internet users, meaning they lack traditional home broadband services. And in general, only 55 to 60% of American adults age 65, no matter what the race and ethnic backgrounds, own a smartphone or have broadband internet access. This is what we call the digital divide. Consumers making less than $24,000 a year represented only 18% of all the new telehealth users and arguably could use even more telehealth access. Less than 40% of the people who live more than, 70, more than a 70 minute drive from a primary care physician have the internet bandwidth necessary for a telehealth visit. So less than 40% have the broadband that's necessary for a telehealth visit. And in a city such as ours with traffic and public transportation concerns, these parallel these geographic barriers. All these pieces of data I just presented to you feed to the same outcome. Drastic disparity in access to healthcare and to achieving good health. Our communities, and particularly those with socioeconomic barriers to good health, have been suffering and are now in even more crisis within the pandemic. We need to take the time to listen and to act swiftly on what we learn with a targeted and community partnered approach. Thank you, Dr. Hajizada. Now we are beginning to understand the needs of our community. Let's turn to the people who see these issues every day. First, Dr. Joan Reedman will introduce her patient, Elizabeth Ortiz, who she has been treating for advanced asthma. So I wanna just say it's really a pleasure and an honor to have Ms. Ortiz talk to us today that um, Ms. Ortiz has had asthma her whole life and has had quite a journey with it and uh, has been in the Bellevue Clinic for I think more than a decade, maybe two decades at this point. The Bellevue Clinic is a city hospital program that uh, was started in 1991. And one would think that since I've been there since 1991, I would have heard all the stories that they're already here. But I will tell you that as a, as a physician in a clinic, one hears and one thinks you know what you're dealing with, but it really is always unbelievably important to hear from a patient really what are the barriers and what are the problems they have had trying to access care and trying to deal with their disease. So I, it's really wonderful to hear that today from Ms. Ortiz and I want to introduce you to Elizabeth Ortiz. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for um, inviting me to this panel. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Um, just listening to uh, the persons who spoke previously, um, I'm impacted um, by the statistics um, and um, on, a, on a two levels. Um, I, I'm here with you today as a patient. However, I'm also a nurse 
who works in an underserved uh, community in the South Bronx uh, with children uh, in a preschool. So just hearing those numbers immediately took me to the children. So thank you. I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit about your journey and what, uh, what got you to get good care and what barriers you faced with and, and what were some of the issues that happened to you? Okay. So um, I have, from what I understand, I have a uh, history of childhood asthma. However, there is a strong family history of asthma in, in my maternal side of the family, in particular to the women, um, which um, is kind of like strange um, for me, like my mother, my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother, maternal side, and then my children and my granddaughter also asthmatics. So that's kind of like how I got introduced to asthma. And um, for as a child, I really didn't have a lot of episodes that I can remember. Um, the family says to me that when I was an infant, I had a lot of asthma. Um, in adolescence, um, it went away. Um, and as a young child, I want to say, because I don't remember asthma attacks, I just remember um, colds and stuff. Um, and then uh, with my first pregnancy, um, it triggered. I got asthma. And um, after I had my children, kind of subsided, quieted down. It wasn't as intense. Um, I want to say maybe about... Uh, about 1996 or so, um, it really started coming on. Um, there was a lot going on in my life and um, I started getting episodes and um, I would get like a lot of the coughing. And one time I got sick and I was just coughing, 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 ended up in the emergency room at Bellevue Hospital. Um, and at that point I was like, oh wait, I need prednisone. They didn't want to give me prednisone because they didn't have me documented as an asthmatic because they had never seen me for asthma. So it was like a Friday or a Saturday. So what they did was they gave me an inhaler and um, gave me an appointment to the asthma clinic on Monday. When I got to the asthma clinic, I remember this very clear. And this was over 20 something years ago. I get to the asthma clinic and I'm told that um, I'm not on the schedule, but I had my little appointment slip and I said, I have an appointment. Long story short, um, I was extremely upset. I couldn't breathe. I didn't feel well. And the nurse is telling me I'm not going to be seen. Um, I'm not a patient you can really turn away. Um, I begin to advocate for myself. Um, and I was very strong that day. And um, one of Dr. Reibman's colleagues, Dr. Linda Rogers at that point came out because I made such a ruckus and she said, what's going on? And I said, um, I need prednisone. I need to see the doctor, I need prednisone. And she was like, well, you need to be seen first. And I said, they don't want them to, they don't want me to be seen. Long story short, she said, go have lunch, come back and um, I'll examine you, I'll take care of you. And thank God, because I was having asthma now it was documented, and that's how I got to the clinic um, at Bellevue. I want to say that I'm extremely grateful to be a patient in the asthma clinic in Bellevue um, for two reasons. Number one, if you're sick as an asthma patient in Bellevue and you belong to the clinic, you call the clinic or you can walk in and you're always seen. Um, that's major. That is really major. So thank you, Dr. Reidman. Um, I know that I can get care there. And um, number two, again, um, having access to medication because I'm uninsured. So being able to get my medication, I'm a self-employed nurse, so being able to get medication at Bellevue Hospital's pharmacy is so important for me. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. Let me ask one more question. What you raised is about medication and being able to get medication. And um, what would have happened to you if you didn't have Bellevue Hospital as your pharmacy? 
it actually, you know, just talking about this just gave me a lump in my throat because to think that I didn't have, that I wouldn't have Bellevue Hospital to get my care and to get medication, I would be coming out of pocket for a lot of money. Um, I would be very limited with the medications that I would be able to get, like paying maybe two or three hundred dollars, let's say, for Dulara a month, because I have to use that, um, would hit me very hard in the pocket. Thank you very much for sharing, in a way, the, the terror and the panic when you're having an attack. And, you know, you were very able to, to really ask for what you needed. But imagine if you didn't know how to do that and couldn't do that. And I think that that helps everyone understand that when you have asthma, when you can't breathe, nothing matters other than you getting that breath and how important it is to have to fight. And it's a shame that you had to fight for that. Yeah. Um, you know, once, once I got in, it was better. Um, again, you know, um, the asthma clinic, if you ask me, I think is, I think they, they're great, <laughs> you know, and as you know, I can be very particular, Dr. Reidman. Um, but, I'm, I'm grateful, you know, and they listen. You, you guys really are there for your patients. Like if I'm sick, I know that I, I have a better chance of seeing a doctor at the asthma clinic than getting a PCP. That's big. Wow. Do I have time for one last question? I'm looking at, let me ask you now during COVID and during this period, and one of the things that uh, was raised was the digital divide and everybody has gone remote. And how have you managed with, with that? And how have you been able to maintain your health healthcare? So thank God that um, the last year I've been more stable. Um, had it been three years ago, I would have been in trouble, as you know, because um, I had a really rough period. Um, because I've been stable, it's been very manageable, and I've, you and I have spoken. Um, I still am a little uncomfortable with not seeing a doctor in person so that my lungs can be osculated. Um, and I'm, I worry about that if I do have asthma, um, can I go to the emergency room? Will I get good treatment? And will they be able to tell the difference between this is an asthma attack or COVID or flu because our symptoms are so related or similar, I should say, that um, that concerns me. The thing of seeing a doctor um, on a screen and the doctor not being able to listen to my lungs um, really makes me nervous. If I was having an asthma attack, like my daughter who's having an asthma attack and who's been for the past two weeks with asthma, and I keep pushing for her to see the doctor and she's had two or three, two televisits, one is as close as yesterday. And the doctor's like, okay, well, we'll do two days of prednisone in a pack. And I'm like, they need to listen to your lungs. So I think that there's uh, really important that when we have the lung disease, that we're able to come into the doctor. And I understand that we don't want to bring patients into the healthcare settings, but that's, that makes me very anxious. Thank you so much, um, Elizabeth, for sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we're going to move on now to our next patient, Maria Agudelo, who is a Spanish speaker and requires a translator for communicating um, and understanding English. And so to assist with Maria, um, we have Sunny Maya with us today. Thank you. Hello, Sunny. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nagin Hajizada will now introduce Maria. Thanks, Sumathi. Uh, I'd like to introduce Maria Agudelo, who is originally from Colombia and has been diagnosed with bronchiectasis. Um, hi, Maria. Hello, good evening. Uh, Maria, how long have you had a chronic pulmonary disease and have you been hospitalized because of it? It was diagnosed only nine years ago. And have you been in the hospital because of it? Yes. About how many times have you been hospitalized for your, for your disease? 
and one of them I was five days and the other hospitalization I was there three days. How often would you say in oh, total stay. you've been in the hospital? Maria, ¿cuánto tiempo dirías que has estado en el hospital? No más de una semana. No more than a week. Okay. Um, when were you diagnosed with the disease the first time? ¿Cuándo fue la primera vez que la diagnosticaron con la enfermedad? María, ¿cuándo fue la primera vez que la diagnosticaron con la enfermedad? Hace nueve años. Cuando tuve mi primer seguro médico por la compañía a la cual yo estoy trabajando. Almost nine years ago, when I, when I first got uh, health insurance with the company that I'm working with now. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about how that process was, how long it took for you to be diagnosed from the first time you went to a doctor about it? Sí. Eh, me empezaron a dar un tratamiento. Primero, pues el doctor me hizo un cascán y ahí fue donde detectó que yo tenía bronquiastasia. Empezó con un tratamiento para mi enfermedad. Pero María, first the doctor saw me did a llevo, cat, diez, cat. llevo 20 años en este país y más de 50 años con este problema. María, espere. Uh, first, I, I went to see the doctor. I got a CAT, CAT scan. That's how I was diagnosed with, doc, uh, with bronchiostasis. And um, María, ¿cuál fue después de que fue diagnosticada? ¿Qué le dijeron? Eh, me dijeron. Me empezaron a hacer un tratamiento médico que me, ha funcionado, que me funcionó y ese fue el procedimiento. Me dijeron que necesitaba oxígeno para dormir porque bajaba el oxígeno más de lo normal. No lo sabía. Espera. Y necesitaba oxígeno para cuando esté, para cuando viajara, tenía que usar oxígeno. So first I got medication, then they said that I needed oxygen to be able to sleep because my oxygen levels were too low and I also needed oxygen to be able to travel. Mm -hmm. And were you able to get these medications and the oxygen? ¿Y usted pudo recibir estos medicamentos y el oxígeno? Gracias a Dios, sí. Sí, le aseguro. The, the, through the insurance. Mm -hmm. what, what are the biggest challenges, would you say, in your life because of the illness? ¿Cuál, cuál es, ¿Cuáles diría usted que son las dificultades más eh, grandes, eh, difíciles en su vida debido a la enfermedad. Las dificultades más grandes, la transportación. The biggest difficulty would be transportation. El, el clima, el frío en especial. Especially the el, cold weather. Y el calor, demasiado para mí. A lot for me. Have there been any problems with language barriers when you go to see doctors? ¿Ha habido algún problema con el, la barrera del lenguaje cuando vas a ver los doctores? Total. Eh, cuando yo he tenido, tuve, tenido doctores pulmonólogos que hablaban inglés. So I've had pero, that, that spoke English, but, pero no era igual porque pero siempre me tenía que traducir y yo no tenía, a veces se le olvidaban a uno las preguntas para mientras uno le traducían, él les respondía y era difícil para mí. It was difficult for me because sometimes you would forget the question that you, you had already thought of while, the, and while they, they, they interpreted what needed to be said and what I would say. Gracias a Dios ahora conseguí una doctora pulmonóloga especializada en mi problema y es hispana. Yeah, thank God I uh, found a pulmonologist, a, a woman, who um, specializes with my issue, and she's um, Spanish, Hispanic. And how about, how about health insurance? How has that been for you, getting access to seeing doctors and to the medication? That's been, has that been okay? ¿Y qué tal el acceso a los doctores y el medicamento eh, con el seguro de salud? ¿Ha sido bien? Excelente. No ha tenido problemas. I haven't had a, a problem. It's been excellent. Have you had people in your community who have had problems with accessing health care and medications? Eh, ¿Ha conocido usted personas en la comunidad suya que han tenido dificultades con accesar eh, 
el, el doctores o medicina? Sí, he conocido personas. Yes, I've known people. Yes. And what do you have any advice for them? I mean, do you what? How do you help them? Uh, because you have good access. Estas personas, eh, ¿cómo se ayudaría a estas personas para conseguir un acceso bueno? Yo pienso que mm, un acceso bueno, por, aunque aquí la mayoría de las personas, algunas personas, perdón, puedo decir eh, que sufren asma, de pronto no tienen documentos y es muy difícil. Esa es una barrera para poder tener un seguro médico. So one of the barriers for people who, who suffer from um, lung um, illness is um, like they don't, they, it, their immigration status, so it's difficult for them to have uh, good health insurance. It's difficult. It's sí, very difficult. Hay farmacias que a través de, de algunas entidades como la que yo trabajo ofrecen eh, me, eh, un descuento en una farmacia que está afiliada a la, a la compañía. Entonces ellos le dan un descuento a los pacientes por la medicina. Yeah, it's very difficult. There are some pharmacies that offer a discount um, uh, for the medication. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's one of the pharmacies, like one that I, that I work for, and they offer a discount for the medication. Mm -hmm. What, based on what you've experienced with your lung disease, Maria, what recommendations or suggestions do you have for doctors and people who uh, make a uh, policy for, for health insurance and for medicine in this country? ¿Qué, qué sugerencia, recomendaciones le daría usted a las personas de, que toman decisiones, la, los legisladores? Bueno, yo eh, desde mi experiencia de lo que he tenido, well, from my from my, mi experiencia, yo pienso que se debieran enfocar mucho lo que es, sobre todo las personas que tienen problemas pulmonales y crónicos, que son bien duros, eh, enfocarse mucho en el problema del paciente, las necesidades en especialmente, por ejemplo, las terapias respiratorias, eh, tratamiento, uh, la nutrición, la alimentación es muy especial para nosotros, de podernos dar cuenta qué alimentos mejoran nuestra salud. Espérame un segundito, María. So I think one of the things that they need to focus in the patients like ourselves that have um, uh, lung illnesses are, um, you know, things like the therapies, you know, take the time to uh, focus on the therapies, the nutrition. La nutrición, ¿qué más, María? Eh, las terapias respiratorias, pero más enfocadas como, thera uh, therapy, como a los ejercicios, a las... On the exercises. Que, hay un lugar, que haya un lugar especial para, para nosotros, para, porque de veras que uno no lo toma tanto, uno sabe que tiene que, que, tiene que hacer ejercicios, pero cuando uno se disciplina en un lugar que le digan a uno, aquí vas a, vas a ejercitarte, vas, vas a estar mejor. Y yo, sé, yo pienso que eso puede funcionar. Yeah, it, for there to be a place it, it, for us to be able to exercise, no, exercise is part of it, for, for us to have a place where, to exercise and say, look, this is, good, this is the place where you're going to exercise. Some place to exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question is, uh, speci especially talking about exercise, what have been barriers for you to getting exercise for your lungs? It, for me, exercise is very important, the therapies. At home, here, even though I don't have a place to go, I, I do exercises here. I have a bicycle. It's a stationary bicycle. Uh, I also have a little uh, machine for my hands and that it, it, it vibrates and it helps me with my circulation. And I also have, it's a little machine that 
it's a little machine where I can breathe and, uh, and it tells me how much ac oxygen is in my body. Uh, and I also have a, a, a little machine that vibrates that I, when I breathe into it, 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 it takes out the phlegm that I have. Uh, I, I do that every, I do that every day. Wonderful. Sounds like you're the perfect patient, Maria. Dr. Drizzo Harris, who specializes, could probably agree <laughs> in this area. Well done. Thank you for your stories, Elizabeth and Maria. Now we're going to open this up for a group discussion around a few key issues that we've mentioned. And some of these questions I'll direct to specific people in the group, but we all have different insights into some of these issues. So feel free to share your experiences. So to start, um, to the whole group, is there something you heard that you were unprepared to hear about or that really surprised you? Anyone? Don't all raise your hands at once. <laughs> this is Ude. Uh, so I, I think for me, what was really um, sort of stark was just the numbers that Dr. Hazizade began with and just how it's getting uh, sort of worse with COVID and, uh, you know, with a disease that impacts, uh, you know, so much of, you know, it's impacting how you breathe and, um, and so many uh, people being impacted by that. It was just, that was, the numbers were very stark. Um, and thank you to Maria and, um, you know, Elizabeth for sharing your stories. Uh, I think as, as impactful as the numbers were, without your stories, they'd be meaningless, right? I think you really brought it to life and about, you know, how Elizabeth was talking about the, just how impactful the clinic has been for her and Maria talking about the barriers. Um, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I think it would be interesting here. I think we have someone maybe from the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene here just to hear, because some of this is uh, structural or systemic issues we're talking about. And, you know, what are some sort of policy responses that, um, that maybe the city's been considering to address, not just the sort of the access and quality of care, but some of those other sort of key determinants that I think we alluded to. It'd be interesting to just hear that because I think it'll round out the conversation. Is there anyone from the city here who wants to speak? Hi, um, I'm Achal Tlati. I'm the director of tobacco policy and programs from the health department. So um, coming at this from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and so I think, especially from the tobacco side of things, um, just, you know, thinking a lot more about prevention, not only in terms of um, smoking, vaping, alternative product use, but also secondhand smoke, especially, you know, we live in New York City where more than half of people report being exposed to secondhand smoke at home from outside of their home um, and thinking about what we can do to prevent those exposures, especially in a time like now when a lot more people are staying indoors, um, both in terms of winter, but also in terms of COVID-19. So I'm thinking about some of those things. And then other things that, you know, may impact um, air quality at home, including, uh, you know, just, you know, pest control, um, and also just like where things are located. I think looking at some of that um, data is not, um, is not something that we all do every day, you know, from a clinical perspective, but but it can be really meaningful to understand like where your patients are coming from and how air quality varies even across the whole city. Thanks. So I just want to say that during the pandemic, when only essential stores were allowed to be open, the vaping store on my corner was allowed to be open. <laughs> so <laughs> I, think that, I think that that's an important point about um, how do we educate and treat about inhalation and prevent uh, environmental exposures, I think it's an Thanks. I had a thing that, that, that caught me a little off guard a little bit, even though I shouldn't. I feel like I've heard enough of these stories. Uh, both Elizabeth, when you were talking about, you know, raising a fuss to where Dr. Linda Rogers made a point, one of the things that kind of strikes me and it uh, to my core is 
it shouldn't have to take a Linda Rogers or a Joan Redman or Negan or a Doreen or a Mangala or Odai. We sh it should not have to be one or two doctors that say, um, I care enough to figure this out. Um, why isn't it upon everyone to say, this is unacceptable? And that's probably what, what, what gets at me the most is you have to, you have to be so vocal to make that point that, that how you're being treated is, is just not right. And you know, when are we gonna come together to say, what are these structural issues that we can fix? And how do we call out those that are not part of the solution, right? And, and I think that, that probably sh strikes me the most at, at this particular, right, of where we are in a country. And um, so I really appreciate you sharing that. And I'm really glad that obviously we have many of the right clinicians here that build on that trust. But also that's one of the things I'm hoping to come away with here is to hear more from others on how do we build those relationships so those stories don't become the standard. And that the, the, the standard is the care you get from Joan is that bare minimum. That shouldn't be the icing on the cake for you, right? Like, well, how do we get to, to a, a better new normal, right? Where we say, this is what you deserve and this is what we're going to give you um, moving forward. Thanks. Um, does anyone else want to share something they were unprepared to hear or surprised about? Or should we move on to the next question? I'm sorry, but for me, it's, it's a little crazy that Maria has to wait for more than 40 years to be diagnosed and to receive the treatment that she had to receive. I, and it was because she had an insurance. She has a good insurance. How many of our patients in our community, they are not diagnosed with a, with a, a illness that is really important to have a good diagnosis and treatment because they don't have the access for health, for a health insurance? Um, if I could, if I could jump in, um, I, somebody else had also asked about policy solutions. And um, so my name is Amanda Dunker. I'm with an organization called the Community Service Society of New York, and we do statewide health policy advocacy. Um, and so there's there's two there's two policy um, things that that we think are that help people a lot. So one is that the Community Service Society of New York runs a statewide program that helps people get access to care. Um, and will help you if you're eligible for some type of coverage, help you get enrolled. Um, anyone can use this service. It's, the, it's called the Community Health Advocates Program, and I'll drop the contact information um, into the chat in case anybody wants to learn more about that program. Um, and then we also have, it's a similar program, it's city funding only called MACAP, and I'm so sorry, I can't remember what MACAP stands for, but it's a similar idea. It's just people who are experts at helping you navigate, like find doctors who are in that work, figure out if you're eligible for any sort of assistance. Um, and we, we help people every day. So we, we, we help people um, like Maria um, every single day who, you know, need help affording insurance or um, we help after the bills start coming in if you can't understand your bill. Um, we help uninsured people. Um, and then that's, so that's the second like policy bucket that we work on is coverage. Um, and so, you know, Maria pointed out that she knows a lot of people um, have trouble getting health insurance because of their immigration status. Um, so that is, um, that is true. That is, you know, New York State has a really good rate of coverage. We have really, really great expensive public programs. Um, but we still have over a million people in our state are uninsured and a lot of them live in New York City. And the biggest group of people in that million population are people who are excluded from public coverage because they are because of their immigration status. You know, maybe they're undocumented or maybe they're in a waiting period or something like that. Um, and so that's a huge problem. We are working on state legislation to get coverage for all of those people. One idea we've been working on for a few years, um, that's ex it, we always get told it's too expensive, but we just think it's important is that we have a program called the Essential Plan in New York State, um, and that's not open to undocumented immigrants. And we think we could cover a lot of, of people who have this immigration barrier by opening the Essential Plan up to that population. You know, just the people who, 
it, it, they would be eligible if it wasn't for their immigration status, you know, like their income or, and everything wouldn't make them eligible, but because they were born somewhere else, they don't get to sign up for this program. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that the state can do, I think, regardless of what happens with the federal government um, to help people, you know, we can expand our public coverage programs a lot. And then I think investing more in programs like community health advocates and programs that help people understand what they're eligible for is really important too. Um, because we know another problem with um, immigrant communities is that um, some people are really afraid of this public charge rule that the Trump administration created. And so, you know, we, we know which programs will affect you under this public charge rules and which won't, but people are very, very scared. Um, and so they, they disenroll from anything. Um, so for example, they'll disenroll from Medicaid, but that Medicaid won't hurt you for public charge. Um, and so that's another thing that a program like Community Health Advocates does is it can talk to people and try and explain, you know, we, we explain like, we, we don't think this will hurt you because of your immigration status, those types of things that are pretty kind of scary, heavy decisions for people to make on their own. Thank you. Could I, um, can I just say that, I'm sorry, can I just say that that's, those programs are wonderful, um, but, you know, they're really trying to put pieces or, or, or help people in little pieces instead of a systemic fix. And I think one of the things that I think I'm always surprised about is to hear someone like Elizabeth Ortiz say that she doesn't have health insurance and she's a nurse. Uh, and that even with the systems that we have in place, that these can be uh, economically uh, devastating for people. So we have to think about how are all these patients really going to afford the insurance and the medications that we are trying to give everybody. So it's just interesting, I think, to hear about this absence of insurance in, in all different. Okay. I think we're going to move on now to the next question, um, which is for patients and clinicians. But remember, we're all patients, so feel free to share your experience as a patient, even if you're a clinician. Um, have you ever had to make a sacrifice or trade-off or know someone who has in order to have the resources you needed? So it could be medication or equipment, anything like that. And what did you have to sacrifice? I'll go. Um, I think that um, for me, the sacrifice has been um, time and energy, loss of wages, um, because um, be, being going to the public health system to access health care, um, basically, um, as a patient, when you're in a patient in a public health um, facility, you know you're going to be, you know, there's the joke of you're going to be there all day, so bring a book, you know, so um, there's that. Um, what other? Um, I want to piggyback onto the, um, the thing with the different state programs and stuff, but still the, the meters, I know we've moved on, but still like the income meters, it's like, if you're over by a dollar, then you can't get in, you know? So I think that we still need to look at that. But um, my sacrifices are my mental health, um, constantly being um, anxious, even having this talk of um, what if I get sick? What if, you know, I can't reach Dr. Reidman? Um, and then um, again, you know, financial, financial sacrifices. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to share as a patient or a clinician? Uh, spit it, it's, it's spit it, Maria. So I just asked Maria. You guys didn't hear me if you were mute, but I asked Maria if there's if she has experienced any sacrifice, um, and she says yes. Prior to me having uh, insurance, so I was worried because they had sent me a medication. Uh, Espriva and the other one that sold the disco and the price was like uh, $200 and uh, it was difficult for me. I didn't know how to buy it and I give thanks to God because that day I, 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 I think give thanks to God because that day 
I was a, const a contestant in a raffle and I won $300. And that day I was able to buy my medication with that money. Yeah. So that was, you know. Yeah, wow. Anyone else want to share on this? I just, my, hi, my name is Jorge Mercado. I'm one of the pulmonologists at NYU. I work at NYU Brooklyn in Bay Ridge area. Uh, and I wanted to first thank, thank you all for inviting uh, us to, to share. I think this is a great idea. And one of the things that uh, I wanted to point out is that the, um, you know, what Clara mentioned and also Elizabeth and, and Maria has shared is that sometimes they, they have these problems of uh, both access and inability to, to maybe get to their medications, get to the doctors. And, and then we have, um, you know, um, pro these programs, these plans, and sometimes uh, they don't get um, to the right uh, people. Um, it, it's kind of lost, uh, for, the, for the lack of a better word, it's lost in translation. So I feel like programs like this are important to, to reach out to the community and make sure that people understand that there are options there, that it's not just, you know, one sole health insurance, but there are programs that can help people to get their medications, to get to the doctors. And uh, as myself, there are bilingual doctors out there that we speak more than one language, um, that are more willing to help uh, our community. And, um, you know, it's sometimes very difficult. I, I can tell you as I am a clinician, but obviously as, as, a, as a person, uh, I'm also a patient and it's very, very difficult to navigate the health system in New York City. Um, so uh, to me, it's very important to find uh, people that can help you navigate that system. And I feel like sometimes patients get lost into that maze that is the healthcare system. Anyone else want to share before we move on to the next question? This is Uday. I, I, just to build up on uh, Dr. Mercado's point, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about um, about sort of uh, translation and language access, but you know, this notion of health literacy, right? That goes beyond just sort of translation of services. And this, um, you know, like I think you're saying, right? It, it's not, it's, it's the difference between us, what we're trying to communicate versus what's understood. And that's not always just the language barrier. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering if, I don't know, I know Mangala is here from the Northwell critical services team, and there may be other providers as well. It'd be interesting to just hear just how do, how do people bridge that gap, right? Which is the, the whole, it's not just saying you can have an interpreter, but even if you're speaking the same language, quote unquote, you're still, there's a huge gap between what the, the, the provider is trying to communicate and the, what's understood by the patient. I was just going to say, I think we saw that today. Sonny was trying his hardest to get across to us what Maria was saying. So if you don't have that, that physician who speaks your own language, you, a lot is lost, both culturally sometimes and just in, in the translation. But, but what I wanted to bring back is, you know, not only do the patients have issues with knowing where to go as, as Dr. Mercado brought up, but the physicians don't know where to go to help their patients. We're often lost. All the insurances are so different. All the patient needs are so different. There's not one place to go online with resources for patients and break it down in each of the categories that we were talking about, right? Help with pharmacy issues and supplements, help with oxygen delivery, help with translation. Where do we find doctors who speak all of these different um, um, languages that we need. It, it's, it's in piecemeal in thousands of places. Um, um, Amanda brought up, you know, um, that, that they have a lot of resources uh, with her services that she's working with. But if the doctors don't know it, how are the patients going to even find it out? So, I mean, that's the first place we could start is, is trying to centrally localize these, whether it's institutions trying and do that or groups collab collaborating together. 
Um, we don't all have social workers who know how to navigate every system. Most of us don't have social workers and the social workers are often very overwhelmed themselves. So I, I do think that's, that's obviously, we've, if there are things out there, we don't know where they are. I also think, uh, thank you for every, for having this and for inviting me. Um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, and I wanted to say that we struggle, especially as ICU doctors with health literacy, because it affects our ability to communicate with our families and patients and it affects outcomes on patients. So it's our job to fix this problem or to make it acceptable for the families that are coming. And this is a constant struggle for people um, because we have such a short time to build relationships with people and explain these complex medical issues. And it's it's very difficult for people and difficult for us. So um, this is a, a good point that you bring up and something that we need to, to work on as a community, I think. Anyone else want to share before we move on to the next question? Yes. Um, on the cultural part, um, it's something I thought about earlier. Um, and then um, where um, I had a student who had severe asthma, I'll make it short, severe asthma, and this child kept getting readmitted. This is in the South Bronx. And I was trying to help, because I'm also a community health education nurse, and I was trying to help the parents understand why, um, what you tried to understand, why was it that he was getting admitted? And then I talked about medication. Long story short, this was a family that came, came in from Africa. And we kept talking to the mom, but we realized who we really needed to talk to was the dad. And once I got dad, and he was able to, I was able to engage him, he said to me, oh, he always goes to the hospital. This is no big deal. And then he ends up in the intensive care. My son is a doctor, so this is no big deal. I actually had to pull out images of the lungs of the bronchioles and show him the normal versus the abnormal and the mucus and the airway and so on and so forth and did that whole education. And at that point he said, Oh, Miss Elizabeth, now I understand. So I think sometimes we have to use visuals. And on the cultural part, we have to see who is the person that's going to be the most, um, that we can reach in the family that's going to understand so like that the patients can get the treatments at home. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question and this one is for the patients so this is the question from maria um and it's when she first realized that her symptoms were more than just a cough or a cold and she needed someone with more expertise um what did the journey to get that care look like like how long did it take how difficult was it so from the my first um 32 days after after um after being born, um, I got como, bronchio, uh, bronchionomia, double bronchionomia. And from then on until I was a, a child, it was always, I was always seen as if I had asthma. Um, time passed and then I always had some moments that I would have, you know, cold, a fever. My dad would take me to the doctor and uh, they would just treat me like if I had asthma. So when I arrived to this country 20 years ago, uh, I, I started suffering even more. Um, but but I'm going to go back to, back to when I was in my country. In my country, it, the, the asthma periods back in my country, they were shorter because, because you know, I would do exercise. I would, I, would run, uh, I, I would run. I would go to the gym. I wouldn't get sick that much. When I came to this country, uh, it was the... the the life was different. Here, uh, I started living in the cold, in the 
in the hot weather, all the all all the stations of the of the the weather, and I started going to my first hospitalization. I lasted four days. They treat they treated it like if it was asthma always. The X-rays, everything, it was treated like if it was asthma. And uh, there were very difficult situations, yes. It's not easy uh, feeling like you're out, like you need that breath of air. But uh, thank God, I've the people that have seen me in, 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 at the hospitals where I've gone to, they've been uh, ver very nice, very helpful, and I've been, and I felt like they supported me. Uh, but it's always been as a form of, like, as a form of <laughs> asthma. How, how old was she when she was diagnosed? Cuando fue diagnosticada? Nine years back, nine years ago, the first pulmonologist, he was the one that um, diagnosed me with bronchial stasis. So how many years had she been in the U.S. by that point? Y ya en ese punto, ¿cuánto tiempo había usted estado en los Estados Unidos? Um, 11 years. Okay, so it took her 11 years. Entonces tomó, le tomó 11 años. Yeah, been very, very difficult 11 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Elizabeth, I think we have the same question for you. Uh, when you first realized your symptoms were more than just a cough or a cold, and you needed someone with real expertise, what did that journey look like? So how long did it take and how difficult was it? It, um, it was difficult because I thought I just had a cold, a really bad cold. Um, until I realized that, you know, the symptoms were intensifying and I ended up in the emergency room. So the journey was um, challenging because not only was I having difficulty breathing, um, but um, I'm one of those asthmatics that doesn't wheeze sometimes. So if you're not wheezing, they think you're not having asthma. I, I just get a lot of cough and um, which that within itself can be tricky. Um, so we have the experience that I that I shared earlier in the emergency room. Um, so that was that was really difficult because I had to come home for two days and literally cough it out while I got to the clinic. Um, and I used that that experience. I've had others, you know, in the emergency room where you're not wheezing, and I'm like, I don't have to be wheezing to have asthma or an asthma attack. I'm coughing horribly, um, and that can be really frightening because. Um, for me, if I don't feel like I'm being heard, it creates even more anxiety and I get upset and I get more tense. So there goes my, my chest getting tighter. Um, so it, it's really frightening. It really is frightening. Um, so um, the did you, journey, like the your, did you ever feel like your health was being dismissed because of your gender or your race or anything else? I think. I think what happens is that at times I could be dismissed because of because I identify as a nurse or the way that I begin to speak immediately they pick up that I'm a nurse so it's like oh she I feel like it's like oh she's just saying this so like that she can get in or she can get out quicker you know so um, I think um, that can come into play um, I think in Bellevue um, in the emergency when I've been there um, at times that can get tricky as well because I'm uninsured, you know? So um, I think a lot of different things come into play, but more so in the way that I present myself because I can be a little more articulate and be sick as heck and still advocate. So it's like, how are you talking if you're that sick? Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. And this is for the clinicians. Um, when first seeing a patient suspected of having a chronic lung condition, what was their journey like uh, before they saw you? So were, were you able to get great context or understanding of where they had been and, and how far they had to come to, to, to see you? Okay, can I go? Because <laughs> this continues to what I was saying before. Um, 
you know, unlike some of the clinicians here, I actually come from outside New York area. I was in Pennsylvania before. So I've seen other ways of, you know, maybe practicing medicine or, you know, interacting with other health systems. And to me, um, you know, New York was very peculiar in, for the patients out there, uh, and to follow what Dr. Adrian Harris was talking about, is that sometimes it's very, very hard to get a record or whatever the other physician was doing uh, before. Now that has gotten better now with the electronic medical records. So we do see sometimes a trail of where the, the patient has been and what has been done to them. Because it's, it's a very important what has the patient has been gone through, what are the treatments so as to not to repeat those treatments and grow in the frustration of the patient uh, that you know, you're just gonna repeat the same diagnostic tests or the same treatments that the patient has gone. So, um, you know, it, it is very difficult here in New York City to have uh, an, a better communication. I always thought that coming to New York City, I had these expectations that because it's a bigger place and, and, and more health systems, there will be more communication between health systems, between physicians, um, and, and, and that's just not the case. Um, I like to say that one of the things that I noticed for many of our patients is how long it took them for someone to understand that they were sick, that we often disregard. Someone says, I can't breathe. I'm short of breath. I have chest tightness. And it's okay. It's only asthma. Uh, and that people don't understand the severity and the terror it, that one has when one can't breathe. And so that very often by the time a patient has come to our program, they've been sick a long time and have been sort of dismissed as only asthma for a long time. The other thing is that I think people don't understand is how severe it could be. So being in the emergency room once or twice or being on prednisone once or twice in a year is terrible. It's a terrible thing. The prednisone has made you a diabetic risk, made you gain weight, made you a little wacko as we've seen our president. Um, and, uh, and going to the emergency room has, as you heard, uh, you know, can be terrifying. You lose work, et cetera. These are terrible things. And yet we sort of dismiss them. We say, oh, they've only been to the emergency room twice in the last year. Well, that's a terrible level of asthma to have. So I think one of the things that we do a lot is really underestimate and under evaluate uh, the severity of the disease and what it means to patients. And that's, I think, all of us across New York and other places. Don, and I wanted to add to that, that I think we have to try and empower our patients when we do patient education and let them know if they're continually coughing, if they're sick, if they're getting sick over and over, they need to ask to see a specialist who deals with lung diseases. Many of them never get to a pulmonologist or many of them never get to a specialized clinic either um, because it's written off as a cough or, re or chronic bronchitis. And it turns out that they've had 10 years of bad bronchiectasis. And by the time I get to see them, their lung function is 50% of what it, you know, what it was. So I do think yeah. patients too need to be educated. And I mean, that's one thing the Chess Foundation has really been working on is educating patients with asthma, with interstitial lung disease, with bronchiectasis, with sarcoidosis to question and ask their doctors, you know, why am I still coughing? Can I see someone who deals with this um, if they haven't? And, you know, it's just one of the things we can do out of, of course, many. I think also I that there's it. such a, the, the point is that there's such a varied experience. Some patients have great experiences and get diagnosed and, you know, get on treatment and some patients take years to get that same diagnosis. Um, so I, I agree, the more education, Doreen, that we can pr provide people, the, the, the better off everyone and the more, the more the experience will be better for, for all. We're going to um, need to move on to the next question in the interest of time. Um, and this is also for the patient. So we'll start with you, Maria, Sunny, if you don't mind translating. Um, what kind of relationship do you have with your clinician? Do you share issues around sacrifice and trade-offs? And when did you know your relationship was built on trust and that your clinician had your best interests at heart? Reality, I've always had um, been in communication with good doctors. I, yeah, I've, 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 I've had trust in being able to speak to them 
and, uh, and now with the new doctor even more because she speaks Spanish and, and there's more liberties to, to speak to her. Yeah, I, I feel more free speaking to her. If there's a certain situation that I'm going through with my issue, I'm able to communicate with the nurse and tell her certain thing. And then it, that has to do with the situation and then she communicates with the doctor and she says, use this, this or that. Yes, and this, at this particular time, I have very good communication with my, uh, with my doctor and my primary doctor. Elizabeth, did you want to add anything about um, your relationship with your clinician and when you sort of um, knew that it was built on trust and, and that your clinician had your best interest at heart? Sure. Um, Dr. Reidman has been my clinician, I want to say maybe the last eight years. Prior to that, it was Dr. Linda Rogers. And um, it took a long time. I was with Dr. Rogers from like 96 to, I forget when, time, time moves. But um, I, it, took me, uh, it took me a while to warm up and trust Dr. Reibman. Um, it took a lot of work on her part um, because I was still stuck on, I wanted Dr. Rogers back. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I think the turning point was when she said to me, you know, I trained Dr. Rogers and I was like, really? And um, so um, it took us a long time to get the rhythm. Um, again, um, I'm a very like um, strong character patient. And um, so it, it took us time to learn how to dance together. And I have full trust of her um, and of the clinic, so. Um, but it took time. I can't give you years, but maybe like five. If I've been with her five or six years. No, a little more, but it took some time. Yeah, uh, Dr. Reitman, do you want to um, sort of give us your take on that and how long, you know, it took you to sort of feel like you had a good rapport and trust your better have said something good. <laughs> no, I want to say something to that that's very important, which is that we're talking about chronic diseases. We're talking about diseases that take a lot of time and it does take time to create a relationship and develop a relationship uh, and understand what someone is saying and how they're articulating something and how you can intervene or not intervene, how far you can push, how you can't push. And that that's the, the, a dance, I think is a lovely word to talk about it, which is really the relationship that forms between the patient and, and the doctor. And it takes time and, and it takes time because these are chronic diseases that change. They get better, they get worse, they go left, they go right. And so it does take some time to develop that. And it, the trust is absolutely important to develop, to create. If I can, if I can build on that, Timothy, really quickly. Um, I had said at the beginning that we can't treat our patients in a void. We have to understand their entire environment. And so many of the barriers that we talk about is the patient will come and we've shifted in medicine from saying non-compliant, non-adherent, you know, the patient's back because they didn't take their medicines. And we thought that we figured it out if we gave them the medications. Oh, but they still didn't take the medications. But there's so much else that's going on in their home, their workplace, that they're scared of being fired if they say something about the smoke or the Clorox that's being used in the workspace. Um, to the stressors in the home, uh, to the pollutants, to speak, one of the speakers earlier was talking about the pollutants in New York City and the pockets in areas in our city where there are just more exacerbations happening because of the environmental exposures and the fumes. Um, and opening up, the, opening up the relationship with the patient so that they can understand all of these other factors that are influencing their chronic lung disease what they can act on, what they can act on, or cannot act on, and where they need help. That's so much of that relationship building beyond just the diagnosis and the medications and access to the medications. And I would just add just to what uh, Nagin is saying, you know, there's, I mean, there's the research behind it, right? That's what the whole social determinants of health are, right? It's that other 80% would determine just sort of clinical outcomes. I think the challenge for some physicians in this is like, even if you do that sort of holistic assessment and figure it out, what do you do then? And having the sort of, you know, it's like, it's not the, 
the toolbox that most physicians have, right? They know how to, you know, if you're a hammer, everything you see is a nail. This is no, you know, criticism of medical education. Uh, but, you know, it, it, what requires is, I mean, it was great when Maria was talking about, right? Transportation was a barrier, right? Whether it was the, the immigration status, the nutrition, the exercise, that's not like you just need more medication, right? And I think we have to sort of expand the sort of toolbox uh, for physicians as well. So, they, it, so it's done in a sort of more easier way as well. But I think it's great that we have physicians who are able to articulate that because I think that's the first step, right? They're advocating for themselves and saying, this is some of the other things. I kind of also want to just say something. Um, my name's Oday Sinekar. I'm one of the uh, pulmonologists in Brooklyn. I was also lucky to train under Dr. Reibman uh, at Bellevue. So one of the things that I noticed in terms of uh, insight and health literacy too, just going off that, is that patients also like to hear things from um, other patients and not just from the providers. One of the things that we've adopted at our clinic is we do a shared medical um, visit. That was pre-COVID, of course. And things that Bellevue and NYU does all the time is symposiums for patients, which have been extremely successful because it reinforces the patient's symptoms, uh, the patient's sort of um, what they've been like experiencing and going through um, all this time. And it builds trust in both the provider um, and the patient's relationship together. And I've noticed that it's been a very, um, sort of was a very helpful thing pre-COVID um, and hopefully we can like reinstate that in the future. Um, and absolutely, I work at a family health center that's federally funded, um, that's trying to, as much as possible, provide a safety net for patients who are undocumented uh, or who have a lot of social determinants that um, limit their access to care. So just like it was said previously, while a lot of social workers are very limited and um, over like loaded with uh, work, it is something that definitely needs to be worked on um, and looked at. So even in clinics where um, the actual care and clinic visit itself is not the limiting factor, it becomes more so about what gets that patient to the clinic um, to be able to see the specialist or provider in the first place. Um, so. Um, thank you. Rudy, did you have a comment to make or? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things. I, I know there's, you have one more question and we're, we're getting close to time. Um, but I, I think one of the exciting things that I've heard, especially the, the last few comments, is a number of the steps that y'all take as clinicians that many others can and should be taking with their patients, right? That that extra step should be the standard, right? Figuring out some of those qualitative aspects of their patient and not looking at a patient as a, as a sheet of paper, right? Where we have a profile written down saying, did I ask these questions and do I understand who they are to diagnose, right? To actually understand who they are more than just to diagnose, but to better understand how I can help them, right? What is the best way I can help treat them? And I think that also plays a role when you think about uh, trust and building rapport, is when you can understand who that patient is and when that, um, when that person, right, that becomes that patient starts to open up, you start to hear and understand some of their issues that may end up affecting how you end up treating them, which is crucial, right, to uh, better outcomes that we're all looking for. But, and Rudy, I just want to add that in the perfect world, that takes time and yeah. resources for the physician. You don't get to learn a new patient in 15 or 20 minutes, or even on follow-up visits, delving into things that might be affecting why they're not getting their medicines or why they're not doing their treatments at home. It takes a lot of time um, to really care for patients the way they need to be cared for. So we have to keep that in mind when we fit, fit, try and build solutions. Well, and that brings up some of those systemic issues that we need to think about are what are the things that we can change or affect, um, whether that's a, a policy perspective and what we need to advocate for, or other things that we can do as an organization to support clinicians finding 
that time and those resources that are available that should be available to you to to your point treat your patient with the care and respect that they deserve i think we have time for um one last question this is for the whole group um why have these issues occurred more often among um, people of color immigrant communities and other vulnerable communities than um you know versus white white communities any thoughts on that Um, this is Joan Wagman. Um, I, I don't have a, an answer for that at all, other than to say that, you know, um, we know that asthma and bronchiectasis exist among many communities, but it's a question of having access to care and health care and insurance. And that means not just insurance to go see your doctor or your provider, but also insurance to obtain appropriate medications as necessary. So I think a lot of it is access to care. I want to say one other quick thing having to do with what we talked about in the environment and as a, as a, a physician and that you often don't know and understand what the environment is that your patient is living in. And it's really helpful to learn that. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been surprised with a very well-dressed patient and then I've had pictures of their house and you know, it's filled with mice and, and they can't get the help to clear it. And there are programs, community health worker programs that do uh, identify that and do identify and will go in and do pest management, et cetera, all these things that are really, really important and are part of the whole holistic care of a patient. So. I'm not answering your question per se. I'm just saying that it is access to care, access to appropriate um, interventions. So my, if I may, my answer to that question is the statistics show that the prevalence is higher in black and brown communities in our city. And on top of that, the exacerbation rates are higher. So something is causing a higher rate of the lo chronic lung disease in our black and brown communities. and. I mean, there's a lot of data that points to structural racism and barriers uh, and generational barriers and acceptance of what normal is and what's okay. Uh, for example, being hospitalized repeatedly or going to the ER repeatedly is okay. It's just is the way it is. You have asthma, you have bronchiectasis, it's not called bronchiectasis, but she just makes a lot of sputum. She does this every now and then becomes kind of the, the norm, becomes accepted. And um, I think that, that, that explains very much where are people living? Who are the people who, who comprise the majority of our poor communities in our city and the disparity to healthy food, food options, uh, high quality health care, high quality daycare? How do you disentangle all of those, um, you know, racism and other structural barriers generationally? to me and to many others is an explanation for why the prevalence is higher in black and brown communities in our city. And then the exacerbations or the inability to control the chronic lung disease has to do with um, access to care, getting to see your doctor faster. I mean, the privilege of being able to call up and say, hey, I, I need help right now. I, I need your attention right now and get that answer right then and there and get the medications right then and there. Uh, that, that explains why the the lack of control for, for the chronic lung disease. Thank you. Um, I think we're I'm gonna move on to Clara Londonia now for some comments. Uh, okay, I have to say thank you so much to everyone that participate today with us. This is an open discussion that I think that we kind of close today and we need all of you to be part of a solution for our community. We have a multicultural city with health problems, but for that, we need to work together. And before, uh, we know already that it's important for us, we, 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 we show the data about the, the loss of health or the access for health insurance in our community. And I will say that it's important the education and the communication between patient and provider, and not only one provider, and the importance of for our patients to have a multidisciplinary uh, treatment where they are uh, working for the the best for them. 
And before to close the session, and thank you so much to Maria and Elizabeth. And now we are going uh, to the executive director of the Chess Foundation, Rudy. And now she will talk about where we go from here. Thank you so much, Clara. Really appreciate that. Um, it, where we go from here kind of speaks to Odai's point of even if we understand the barriers, uh, who are we as clinicians or community members or people that are part of organizations and patients? What are we going to do about it? And I think it's incumbent upon all of us, right, um, to support one another first off. Uh, to listen to one another and hear the many different perspectives that play a role in these challenges. Um, and, 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 I, and I want everyone in, to understand that this listening tour is just the beginning. Um, this is a, going to be a long road, um, but one that we're committed to. And I think the, one of the best ways to show that commitment is through the work that we can do following up. Because this was, the, and honestly, right, this is the easy part. The hard part comes with us rolling up our sleeves, digging in, coming up with clear recommendations based off not only the information we've heard tonight, but other conversations that we've had with many other patients and caregivers in the New York City uh, area, as well as, as well as other listening tour stops that we're having across the country. And so in the coming weeks, you will get a report uh, very similar to the one that we've produced in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, but one that is specific to New York City um, that talks about the specific challenges that New York faces, but might be challenges that other communities face as well, and potentially some of the solutions that are, um, that are born from this conversation are things that we can impart in other communities across our country. And so our responsibility to you is not only to deliver that report, but to continue that conversation going to raise your voice as those in the community that can affect change the most. So you are our key stakeholders here. And I don't want that to be lost on you with how much influence that you have on, on changing these outcomes. I understand a lot of sustained change will come with policy, um, but true change starts with people on the ground that says enough is enough. And it starts with this conversation and we'll move forward with that. Um, so. Not only will we send out the report, um, but we will continue to have further conversations and, and to show you our commitment to this. Um, every dollar raised in the New York City area that we're able to um, support these particular uh, areas of inter interest and trust, access, and equity, um, we will be matching as an organization dollar for dollar in support of uh, the programs in the New York City area. Um, and on top of that match, um, we've also received a firm commitment from our organization, our, our parent organization, CHESS, which Dorian happens to be a great leader in, um, that they will be making a large seed investment um, into a fund so we can ensure that we sustain any programmatic efforts that we have been able to make uh, locally in New York and other communities across the country. And so we're excited to bring that forward. And, and I would say we'll, we'll keep you in the loop on, on some of those pieces and, and how we finalize them. But I would say before Thanksgiving, uh, we should have a finalized report to share with you and more information about how we're moving forward with the rest of our listening tour. So thank you very much.